Uh, Professor Sagatagus is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He leads the Arcana Research Group, which focuses on data-oriented computer architectures and systems, energy efficient uh, memory and storage, and architectures for emerging platforms and domains. Thank you very much, uh, Sagata. The state is yours. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Juan. Um, and uh, no, I appreciate you doing the introduction. It'll save me about a minute or two on some of the things I was going to talk about. But uh, yeah, today <clears throat> I'd like to go over some of the work that we've been doing in my group, looking at tackling some of the challenges that uh, Juan uh, actually summarized uh, just right now. <clears throat> and so I'm not going to go over this example because you know, Juan actually set this up really well. The basic premise of PIM, processing memory, is that essentially we want to eliminate this unnecessary data movement across this memory channel that we see, which is really a, becoming a problem in a number of emerging applications and domains. And the goal here is to essentially add some sort of functionality close to the memory that can do many simple computations. And in reality, while people have talked about this concept since the 1970s, there are two key sets of innovations over the last decade that have really brought us closer to reality here. Uh, the first are new approaches to designing memory architectures and to integrating heterogeneous components. And the second is new ways of looking at existing and emerging memory technologies and seeing how they can interact with each other to perform meaningful logic. And this has done two things. First, uh, many of you have probably seen this, but there's now a flourishing body of research that exists on PIM. Uh, I'd argue it's becoming a, a very hot topic in the last couple of years. But more importantly, we do have these actual prototypes that are on the market. Uh, and as Juan mentioned, we like to classify these sort of in two groups, processing near memory, where you have CMOS-like circuits and logic that uh, sit in or near the memory chip. And you know, a number of manufacturers such as Upmem, Samsung, and SK Hynix have put out prototypes of these types of processing near memory devices. And then we have processing using memory, where you can effectively turn on two devices at once, and then the interaction between them does meaningful computation. You no longer need discrete ALUs or ALU type logic to perform operations. And there are also prototypes of this in the market today. Uh, a number of companies are working at it. A couple of the more prominent ones are from Mythic and IBM. And so you might sit here and say, okay, well, that's great. Companies are making prototypes. We must be done now, right? Our the work on the research side is finished. But I'd argue that the prototypes that we see have uh, fall into one or two categories. Either they target specific domains and therefore have specific abstractions that people can use, or they require programmers to have a reasonably deep knowledge of the underlying architecture that they're programming for. And we're sort of hitting classic issues that we've dealt with in the past. While we have a lot of work in the community looking at novel memory devices or architectures and microarchitectures, we have many, many application domains that could benefit from eliminating data movement, but they can't with our current uh, setup and uh, ecosystem that we have. And so in reality, we need to focus on completing the compute stack from top to bottom to enable this for you know, what I argue is the widespread general purpose case. And to me, this really takes two key questions. First, how do we take the many novel ideas that we have that we're generating in the research community and actually translate them to something that's practical to manufacture. And then once we have that hardware, how do we abstract enough of the low level details away so that we can actually build a full uh, software stack that can end to end support running a program on this new hardware. And so today I wanna to talk about three key areas where we can as a community benefit from tighter integration. The first, is enabling cooperation between the microarchitects, the circuit architects, and the device physicists. We can't work in isolation anymore. We can't simply just read a lower level paper and try to pull out information. And what we need to do at our the high level that we operate at is to really consider two, fundamental, uh, two key types of device limitations. The fundamental limits of the materials themselves, as well as the limits of what we can manufacture today or in the near future. Uh, and I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about work that we did that actually took this philosophy of cooperation across the hardware stack. 
uh, called Racer, an architecture that we've developed for POM, for processes in memory, where we overcame a number of these limitations uh, in, in what I'd argue is a fairly efficient way. But then hardware itself isn't enough, right? We, we as architects and circuit designers are focused on cool new hardware. But I argue that we're at a point now where if we're going to go further, we need a software stack. And before we can get to a software stack, we need an instructions of architecture, an ISA. We need a platform that allows people to write portable software that can be reused as the architectures change. It does not do us any good if software developers have to rewrite programs and a tool chain in a couple of years because we weren't sure which of the architectures is the one that's going to be dominant going forward. Once we have that ISA, then we need to start thinking about what I'd argue are difficult problems that we've frankly been punting as a community. Uh, you know, in papers, we'll often either map things by hand or we'll come up with simple solutions that cater to the set of workloads or the architecture that we're looking at. But going forward, we need robust general purpose solutions to a number of the hard problems that we're facing on the software side of things. And so I want to start by taking a little bit of that look on the hardware side and where integration can help us and sort of giving you a little bit of a, a glimpse of that example. And I'm going to start by looking at the devices that we were looking at in the work that we studied, uh, resistive RAM, RAM. Uh, resistive RAM is interesting because you can build a device where you can read and write data without the need of an access transistor. Um, Essentially, we have a column line attached to one end of the device and a row line attached to the other end of the device. And when you turn both of those on at the same time, you can actually read the device that connects those two together and get the data value out. And so what you can do is take a whole bunch of row lines and column lines and put a, a reram cell at the inter, uh, every intersection of the two. And that's what we call a cross point array. Now, the reason I bring this up is because RERAM devices arranged as a cross point can actually enable a number of meaningful computations. Uh, there are a number of works, particularly in the AI ML domain that look at multi-level RERAM cells where we have three to five bits of data in each uh, RERAM device and we can perform approximate multiplies and related operations. What I'm gonna look at and the stuff that we looked at for RACER uh, instead treats these devices as digital, which I'd argue is a bit easier to fabricate uh, today. And so we store a single bit in each cell and we can actually do Boolean operations with this. Uh, for example, in, the, uh, in this diagram got below, if we take this row line and we float the row line voltage so we don't tie it down to anything, uh, we can turn on these two input cells with a specific voltage designed for the logic. And what that will do is that we'll put a current on that floating row line that will be equivalent to the norm of these two cells. And I can take that value and write it back to a third cell. And people have looked at a number of different ways of taking not only RERAM, but other memory technologies such as DRAM, SRAM, uh, MRAM, phase change memory, and performing Boolean logic in a similar fashion. And going one step further, uh, there's been a fairly large body of work looking at developing PUM architectures that do bit serial operations using that underlying uh, primitive. And so bit serial operations are, are kind of efficient. You know, we often look at additions as the prototypical example, uh, where I start with bit zero, I generate a sum and carry out, and I propagate the carry out as the carry in for the next bit, compute bit one's value. And I do this until I get to the most significant bit. And it turns out that PUM architectures, such as a NOR capable RERAM based architecture, can perform many bit serial functions. And there's a lot of flexibility in the type of work that you can do. But unfortunately, bit serial operations, as many of you probably know, incur very long latencies. And so what architects have done is that they've taken this capable device and they've essentially looked at arranging uh, architectures with large memory arrays. In these cross point arrays, instead of turning on a pair of cells at a time to do an operation, I can actually perform bulk Boolean logic where I turn on entire columns at a time and do NOR on the entire column. And so the larger the column is, the more work I extract. Essentially it can exploit data level parallelism here. And that can provide me with throughput, not only to compensate for the bit serial latencies, but to actually provide much higher throughput than conventional memory technologies. Of course, I wouldn't be talking about this if this is all great and it worked fine. Unfortunately, what we found was that while people have been focusing on this, on trying to expand the column size, 
we actually hit a big problem, which is that for every additional cell we add to the column, as we grow that column size, we need that much more current to drive that cell to actually perform the logic. And unfortunately, this hits up not against the devices themselves, but against the physical current carrying capacity of the metal wire. And so much so that when you have too many cells, the wire metal will start breaking down. Now, the thing that we were shocked to find out is that the size of that column that starts, you know, that, that exceeds what we can do, it's actually really small. It's difficult for us in practice to make arrays that have more than 200 cells in a column. And so this creates a conundrum. Um, now we don't have an easy way of buying back that uh, bit serial latency cost. And on top of that, the memory world has long stayed away from small tiles because it's difficult to amortize peripheral circuitry overheads and, and controller overheads across small arrays. And so what we sat down and we worked with circuit designers and the device physicists to figure out is, can we make small tile based problem practical? Is it possible or are the overheads just too much? And so the work that we did, it took us you know, our, you know, about four years to actually sit down and start talking each other's language. But eventually we came up with Racer as a solution to this. Now Racer starts with a simple premise where typically if you look at conventional architectures, we often store multiple bits of award in a single tile. In Racer, instead what we do is we put each bit in, its, in a separate tile. And so we do this idea of bit striping. What's key here is that the, no, the bit for a corresponding word uh, always stays in the same column and the same row across the different tiles. This allows us to do a few things. First, in order to send the bit serial information from one bit to another, I now need to connect tiles together. We connect our tiles using re-RAM buffers. Uh, this allows us to perform communication from one tile to another without having to do any A to D or D to A conversions, which has been a flaw of, of prior uh, Palm architectures. And on top of that, this buffer enables this new concept that we call bit pipeline. Essentially, we can now exploit parallelism across the different bits of a board. And so if we go back to our ripple carry edition example, uh, looking at this tile where as we go down, I'm showing you the progression of, of computation over time. I can start by computing the sum and carry out for bit zero and tile zero. Then I propagate that carry out information through the buffer to tile one. Now tile one starts its computation, generates a carry out and propagates the carry out from bit one over to tile two so that we can keep going with the compute. However, what you'll notice here is that while tile one is performing its computation on bit one, Tile zero now sits idle, and we can actually exploit that to do a whole new operation on a completely uh, different set of wards. And effectively, what this allows us to do is to treat the tiles as pipeline stages and the buffers as pipeline registers, and actually be able to get pipeline throughput where for T tiles, I can get T times the throughput that I had in our prior approach to Palm architectures. Now, the next thing that we look at here is how we can control this, how we can enable this pipeline. Well, we take advantage of the fact that each bit in a bit serial operation is more or less doing the same exact operation. And so what we can do is we can take our knower commands, our micro ops, and we can store them in per tile queues, but we can tie the queues together so that the uh, micro ops done by queue zero are sent to tile uh, one, to repeat them for the next bit of data. And instead of having to generate microops for every tile for the bit serial computation, I only need to generate one tile's worth of commands. And we've designed this in a way where we can control how wide we propagate this to. And this gives us granularity from a byte of data all the way up to a 64 bit word. The final thing we tackle in Racer is the scalability issue. How do we amortize the overhead of that control circuit that I just showed you? and peripherals efficiently. And so we have our tiles of VRAM devices. And as I mentioned before, we have a tile per word. And so we put those into what we call a pipeline. Now, instead of having one set of control circuits and peripheral circuitry for a pipeline, we actually amortize that cost over 64 pipelines. 
And so this allows us to not only efficiently be able to support multiplexing, but then I can, for example, have one IO device shared across 64 tiles and still maintain the throughput of DDR for DRAM. And in fact, the nice thing about this is that using back end of line integration, I can put the reram cells on top of the control circuitry and on top of the read write circuitry. So this allows us to have a very efficient, still highly amortized device. And on top of that, this cluster that we have, we can scale it. This is an independent unit of uh, computation. And so depending on the needs of my platform that I want to integrate this in, I can either have a single cluster with uh, two megabytes worth of storage and compute capability, or I can scale this to something as large as eight gigabytes in a single chip. Uh, I'm just gonna show you a couple of quick comparisons in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we compare against a state-of-the-art 16 core uh, CPU with both off-chip DRAM and on-chip MRAM. And we also compare it to a state-of-the-art GPU and to a uh, duality cache, a compute and SRM architecture. Uh, we modeled everything from the device level all the way up to the circuit level. Uh, we talk about abstractions in the paper and we have synthesized everything in a 50 nanometer uh, technology node. But just as a quick glimpse across a number of data intensive applications compared to that 16 core um, uh, CPU with speed up on the Y axis, uh, Racer gives us an average of 107x speed up over that 16 core CPU. And in fact, we get speed ups across all of the different configurations that we look at here. And it's not just speed ups. Racer also gets a significant energy savings as well. Uh, again, compared to that 16 core CPU, we can get 189x energy savings um, simply because we're doing things in place and we have very efficient circuitry to make this happen. And again, across all of the configurations, we see you know, healthy uh, energy benefits. So what's the takeaway here? Yes, there are device limitations that we have to worry about, but if we work hand in hand with, you know, across the hardware stack, even though we're attacking these limitations, we don't need to give up performance and energy. We can still get significant wins if we work together. And so the two takeaways I have here is that, you know, as architects and as you know, circuit architects, we need to really serve as a bridge. We need to think about the low level design and we need to work together with them. We can't simply just look at a paper that someone published uh, in a device conference like IEDM, pull out numbers from a table and then uh, declare victory and build our architecture from that. We also need to close the loop. As architects, we need to be driving the requirements of these future devices. Uh, for example, just as my anecdote with what I've seen with RERAM, uh, a number of device physicists are still focused on trying to lower the voltages and the currents of the devices. And while that can help us, the numbers I showed you in the previous slide are with devices that are on the market today or will be on the market in a year or two. We can get large wins without reducing the voltage and current further. Instead, what we need device physicists to focus on are improving the lifetime of these devices and improving the switching tolerances for them. So what do I mean by that? Uh, Rerim devices are defined by the voltages we use to set the value to one, to reset the value to zero, and the voltage that we use to perform logic. And so the ratios between those three voltages, which I'm showing you on the X and Y axis in this graph, are really critical to enabling uh, functioning devices. Now, what people proposed in the past to enable operations such as the NOR I just showed you, uh, Magic and Felix, those, the devices that they're compatible with fall in this green box in the left-hand side. Unfortunately, the devices that we can build today don't really fall within that green box at all. In fact, they fall within this hashed uh, quadrant of the graph. And so what we did was we sent, you know, we went back to the device physicists and actually worked with them to figure out a more practical device that can enable NOR operations while still meeting the requirements that we have for something like Racer. And we actually came up with this new primitive called Oscar, which we talk about in our JetCast paper that came out last month, mm -hmm. that actually enables practical Boolean operations for the devices that we can build today. So that's the hardware side. And I argue there's still a lot of work to be done to evolve hardware into what are, you know, what are much more practical architectures. But then we also have to focus on the other side now as a community. And I think the reason we haven't done this is because there hasn't been a clear winner for an architecture. We don't know what type of PIM we want to do. We don't know what the underlying devices are going to be. We don't even have consensus on the microarchitecture yet. 
it's difficult to go to people designing software and have them design software when they don't know what the target is going to be or whether it will change in a few years. And so we need to really take a page out of what computers were doing back in the 1960s, like with what IBM did for the System 360 in 1964. We need to think about abstractions. If we're going to build portable, reusable software, we have to make it so that as we're still evolving the underlying architecture, we can still use our tools to be able to make this work. And so I argue that as a community, now is really the time that we need to start thinking about what an ISA looks like for PIM. And there haven't been very many works that have looked at this, unfortunately. Uh, there are a few. Uh, I'm going to look at a few examples. For Racer, for example, what we did was we took that pipeline of tiles and we abstracted it away as a vector core. And we came up with our own custom ISA with a number of fairly generic instructions. There have been a number of other works, such as uh, PIM enabled instructions, you're going to hear about Cindy in a little bit, and CAPE, which actually used the RISC V extension sets. These are all potentially viable ways of implementing an ISA. But as a community, we need to have some consensus in what the common set of functions are going to be if software developers are going to try to use that as the base. We don't want them to have to understand the underlying microarchitecture as much as possible. And the ISA itself isn't enough. Uh, frankly speaking, programmers will have a tough time thinking about new types of architectures if they have to learn a whole new programming model. So in an ideal world, we need to make these new PIM architectures look as close to what programmers are used to. I'd argue the ideal vision for a programmer is to make PIM look as much as we can like another core. But that means there, that all the things that programmers have come to expect from multiple cores, we need to start providing them on the PIM side. And these are, again, very fundamental things that we need to think about. Uh, you know, Data partitioning is the one that sort of comes to mind for me. We often hand tune our applications to try to partition data to optimize how PIM works. Programmers aren't going to be able to do that very easily. They either need to have a very deep knowledge of the hardware or we need to provide them with tools to automate that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about cache coherence, but we have a work that we looked at in ISCA 2019 that tackles some of the challenges there. I'd encourage you to go read that and I'm happy to talk with you about that offline. But then we can't simply just solve these as you know, individual point examples either. We also need to think about integrating those solutions for a top to bottom tool chain for programmers. That means we need friendly programming models that programmers are used to, they're comfortable with. That also means we need compilers that can not only look through a high level program and identify opportunities for PIM, but generate heterogeneous binaries where one of those binaries targets a PIM architecture in that ISA that we hopefully will develop as a community. And as part of this flow, we need to think about how we can automate that data mapping so that automatically we can try to maximize the benefits that we get uh, from the locality of operands in these PIM architectures. And then we need to think about the system itself and how this hardware and how this, these programs actually work in the context of our existing components. So this means we need to think about OSs and runtimes that can actually manage PIM execution. And the other thing that I argue that we need to think about is multi-tenancy. It's rare for us to have accelerators that we sort of use on their own. Uh, programs don't typically have exclusive access, especially for some of the sizes of these PIM architectures that we're talking about. And so how do we support multiple threads? How do we support context switches? And importantly, how do we isolate the data of one thread for, from another? We need to think about not only the uh, allocation aspect of memory virtualization, but also memory protection and how we create strict boundaries for these applications. And so hopefully this gives you a little bit of motivation into some of the problems that I think we need to be looking at as a community. Um, just as a quick recap, I think there needs to be really solid cooperation across the hardware side of things and across all the different levels where we work hand in hand. And it takes time for us to learn each other's language, but the, without that, it becomes really difficult for us to innovate uh, into something that's actually going to be made in the future. And we also need to think about the right abstractions that allow us to enable software that we can build and create a, a top to bottom tool chain that applications and developers can make use of. So with that, I just wanna quickly acknowledge the uh, many collaborators that worked with me on this work. 
and I will be happy to take you know quick questions afterwards. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Sagata. Are there any questions? So hi, Sagata. This is Stefano Di Carlo from Torino. Um, hi, Stefano. Hi. Um, so thanks for the nice presentation. I have one question regarding uh, your last part uh, when uh, you talk about the need of uh, instruction set architectures and other tools. Um, do you think, uh, since we are switching to a completely different model, uh, do you think it's also an opportunity to uh, like uh, uh, push programmers to uh, um, let go with the traditional programming languages and try to uh, uh, try to use something a bit more exotic that can uh, exploit the capabilities of in-memory computing, or should we stick with the traditional languages and try? to make the memory stuff completely transparent to the programmer? I think that's an excellent question. And what I would argue is that it's, to me, it's not that we have to choose one of those approaches. We actually need a spectrum. Um, I believe that initially, well, here's the thing. I'd argue that if we were to start clean slate and we could get programmers to sort of get in line and, and you know, believe what we want them to, that we would take exactly the approach you mentioned, Stefano, that we would come up with these new optimized programming languages, programming models that are really capable of exploiting the maximum benefits that PIM can provide. The problem is that it's difficult for us to make that kind of change and simultaneously convince programmers that there's this brand new piece of hardware that's going to solve so many of your problems and it's worth taking the time to basically throw out so much of what you've learned. So to me, I imagine there's sort of this intermediate step uh, where we have programming models and programming languages where they're more traditional and we might not be able to get 100% of the benefits of PIM, but maybe we get 70, 80% of the benefits, which are still pretty large. And this basically allows us to sort of sneak in and convince uh, these programmers who might rightfully be skeptical that, hey, there's benefits for you. You can come and take you know, language that you used before, such as CUDA, um, and you can actually get benefits. And once they see that there's benefits, we can then tell them, oh, if you want to get more, now we have these customized programming languages and tools that, yes, you have to learn a little bit more about, but you can get even more of these benefits that we've provided. And so to me, it seems, the way I believe it is that it's almost a sort of journey over the next few years where we start off by giving them something that they can use so that we avoid, honestly, the infant mortality that a lot of hardware devices have seen in the past. And then once we sort of wean them onto our hardware, then we can provide these new models that sort of take things to the next level and, and hopefully engender a bigger change at the programming language side. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much, Sagata.